Have you ever wondered what the oldest socks in the world are? You probably haven't, but I have, and since you're almost certainly wearing some right now and you've clicked on this video, why not find out? I bet none of your friends know, maybe you can impress them with your knowledge of esoteric sock lore. Depending on whether you like this or not, this might be the first installment in a series exploring the oldest example of everything, i.e. every type of thing I bother to cover. And I don't mean what's thought to be the oldest version of that thing if it doesn't exist anymore. I mean the oldest example of that thing, whatever it may be, that you could actually hypothetically see in person today right now. So slam that like and subscribe button if you are an enlightened intellectual who hungers to learn useless history trivia. Anyways, back to the socks. When first embarking on my quest to find the oldest sock in the world, the first thing I stumbled across was an article from Smithsonian Magazine about these sort of odd-looking but pristinely preserved split-toed socks made in late Roman Egypt sometime during the 4th or 5th centuries AD, or maybe even as early as the year 250. These socks are also one of the earliest surviving examples of knitting in the world, so now you have a nice conversation starter for your grandma. They were discovered in a cemetery of the famous but almost most impossible to spell Romano-Egyptian site of Oxyrhynchus in the late 19th century. They eventually made their way to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Oxyrhynchus is famous due to how great the dry climate of Upper and Middle Egypt is at preserving stuff for thousands of years. It's yielded an incredible amount of papyrus documents, everything from private letters to rare classical texts to early fragments of the New Testament. And these strange bright red socks were among them. The the reason the toe is divided is that the sock was originally meant to accommodate sandals, proving that sandals are actually supposed to be worn with socks. The big toe would have gone into one part and the four other toes would have gone into the other part, and the tops have loops that you could actually use to fasten them to your feet. In general, they actually look pretty similar to the cotton tabby socks still worn with traditional geta and zori shoes worn by old-fashioned Japanese and weebs. The socks from Oxyrhynchus were made using a process called now binding, but since I refuse to properly pronounce characters with weird symbols on top of them, I'll just call it single needle knitting, which it's also called. It was of course the precursor to knitting with two needles, but it was actually closer to sewing than knitting. It was also very time consuming, required a lot of skill, and unlike modern knitting, you couldn't use an indefinite length of thread. But since it can create really elastic forms, it was frequently used to create close fitting garments, especially for the head, the hands, and of course, the feet. There are actually some older now-bound textiles from the Tarim Basin in China made around 1000 BC and some from Peru from around 100 BC, but unfortunately I don't think there are any socks among them. But it turns out these socks aren't the only pair of its kind and not by a long shot. Smithsonian Magazine actually released yet another article about a very similar sock from a landfill at another Roman site in Middle Egypt, Antonopolis. It was found during the 1913 to 14 excavation season there, along with loads of other amazingly well-preserved textiles. This was the city built by Emperor Hadrian after his gay lover Antinous's corpse washed up there after he'd thrown himself into the Nile. This multicolored stripy sock was once worn by a child on their left foot sometime in the 3rd or 4th century according to radiocarbon dating, and it now sits in the British Museum. The article was written in the first place because in 2018 the dyes applied to the sock were analyzed using multispectral imaging by a team of museum scientists. They found that the seven hues of wool yarn on the sock were made from mixing together three different plant-based dyes, red from matter roots, blue from woad leaves, and yellow from weld flowers. You're not alone, I hadn't heard of any of those either before this. The two dark green toes also happened to have been made separately and were then conjoined, with the sock being made from the toes upwards. Multiple other very similar socks were discovered at the same site, including a righty, so I'm holding out hope that the righty still survives somewhere out there. And there are actually way more of these socks, all around the same age and made using single needle knitting, sitting in various other museums all over the place. They're often called Coptic socks, since they were mainly made during the period when each Egypt was predominantly Christian, and Egyptian Christians are called Copts. Not Cops, Copts. 
Heights. There's another bright red one in the BM, and another one from Antonopolis, which still bears the impression of the sandal thong it was strapped into. Here's one in the Petrie Museum in London from the site of Hawara, and here's another stripy one in the National Museum of Scotland. And here's one in Washington, D.C.'s Textile Museum, and another stripy kids version in the Manchester Museum, also hailing from Oxyrhynchus. There's also a whopping 11 of them just sitting in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, making it, and by extension, the glorious nation of Canada, the place that the largest collection of late Roman socks in the world. Take that, Britain. Loads of talented knitters have also made some really nice wearable replicas, by the way, and if there were any on sale, I'd definitely buy some. And I can't forget this astounding second century shroud in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York from somewhere in Middle Egypt depicting a woman wearing socks exactly like this underneath her sandals. So by now you must be thinking, oh, these Romano-Egyptian socks must be the oldest in the world, right? And a lot of articles online claim that. And, you know, that's what I first thought too. But upon doing a little more research, I found that there's a sock that might be slightly older from pretty much the opposite end of the Roman Empire. Northern Britain. Specifically, the site of Vindolanda. Vindolanda, now in Northumberland, was a Roman fort on the northern frontier of Roman Britannia, just two miles south of Hadrian's Wall. Like Oxyrhynchus, it's most famous for the stunning amount of written records that have been found there, this time in the form of wooden writing tablets, which actually make up the oldest known archive of written material from all of Britain. One of these writing tablets, now in the British Museum, even mentions a pair of socks, called Udonum, being sent to one of the men at the fort along with two pairs of sandals and two pairs of underwear. Well, the underwear hasn't been found yet, but a whopping 5,000 shoes and at least one sock have. Vindolanda yields such amazingly well-preserved organic material because the excavation layers dating to before the Emperor Hadrian's time are oxygen-free due to a combination of how waterlogged the ground is and how they were sealed off by later building work. As a result of this, Vindolanda also harbored the largest collection of surviving Roman textiles in Western Europe, woven almost entirely out of local sheep's wool. Of course, the most interesting of these, for our purposes today, is the one sock found at the fort. It was the only complete garment found at the site besides a shoe insole, and it was discovered within one of the rooms making up a praetorium, i.e. the garrison commander's residence. The praetorium, and thus the sock, date to the third period of Vindolanda's occupation, which has luckily been narrowed down to between 97 and 105 AD. So unlike with the Egyptian socks, we know almost exactly when these socks were made, and it seems to be slightly older than them. The sock once belonged to a child, and it was made from two separate pieces of wool fabric, the sole and the upper bit, roughly tacked together. It currently sits in the museum at Vindolanda. Part of another possible sock was found in the yard outside the Praetorium, but there don't seem to be any pictures of it, and I don't know where it currently is. There also happen to be some pretty neat depictions of Romans wearing socks in their sandals from all around Britain. These include a bunch of weird bronze knife handles in the shape of feet, and the foot of a bronze statue unearthed in Southwark, South London. So is the oldest surviving sock in the world the Vindolanda's sock? I just couldn't believe that no one thought of using socks prior to the first century, so I kept digging a bit deeper. I knew that even if Roman Egyptians wore socks with their sandals, the pharaohs certainly never did. So did people even wear socks before the advent of the Roman Empire? Well, the answer is yes. Prior to the Udones described in the letter from Vindolanda, Romans both in the Republic and the early Empire wore something called fascia, which were sort of like socks in that they were meant to keep your feet warm, but you had to wrap them around your foot. They could be made of leather or cloth and were introduced sometime in the first century BC, possibly from Gauls to the north, who had to deal with chilly French winters. They were originally viewed as effeminate, and Cicero even mocked someone for wearing them one time, but as as the toga fell out of fashion and legs became more exposed, fasciae became more common among men, according to authors like the poet Horace. But according to the first century AD rhetorician Quintilian, however, you still had to be ill to get away with using them. Some believe that the word sock actually came from another sock-like thing the Romans wore, the socus, which derived from the Greek term sikchos. The term refers to a slipper-like half-shoe worn by comic actors. 
As you can probably guess, it was originally worn by the Greeks, and both men and women originally wore it. But like with anything Greek, the Romans originally considered wearing sake to be effeminate, and when the second century historian Suetonius mentions that the mad emperor Caligula wore them, he said, they're used by females. Though by the time of Diocletian's price edict, at the beginning of the 4th century, they were used by both men and women. But we actually know of even older socks. The first written reference to anything like a sock comes from the archaic Greek poet Hesiod, who lived in the late 8th century BC. In his poem, Works and Days, which is meant as advice to farmers keeping livestock, he recommended that farmers should wear ox hides on their feet in cold weather, and that the interiors of them should be cushioned with something called peloi, which was a kind of sock made from matted animal hair. This poem is usually where the history of socks is said to begin, and thus where the trail of old socks ends. Apart from conjecture, that people in the Stone Age tied animal skins to their feet to keep warm, almost none of my sources mentioned any physical socks from prehistory. But guess what? There actually is one, or maybe even two, and they're both over 5,000 years old. In 1991, two hikers made a miraculous discovery in the Ötztal Alps between Italy and Austria. The mummy of a man who had died there upwards of 5,300 years ago, perfectly preserved by the ice. He's best known as Otzi the Iceman. Everything he had with him at the time of his death was preserved, too, including his stunningly high-quality shoes made of bear skin and deer hide over netting made from tree bark. And those shoes were stuffed with bunches of soft grass that would have once surrounded Otzi's feet and acted as his socks. Okay, you might be a bit underwhelmed, but apparently the grass worked pretty well as a makeshift sock. A Czech researcher and shoe expert named Dr. Peter Hlavacek created a replica of Otzi's shoes, complete with his grass socks, and actually went hiking in them for 12 miles at 10,000 feet in the Alps while it was 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Apparently, the grass insulated his feet really well and wicked moisture away from his feet. Otzi's shoes and grass socks have been radio carbon dated to between 3,118 and 3,365 BC, meaning they date to the so-called Chalcolithic or Copper Age, when copper smelting was invented. Along with all of Otzi's other stuff and Otzi himself, the shoes are in the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology in Bolzano, Italy, since they were literally just 50 meters into Italy when first discovered. So I know what you're thinking. These have to be the oldest socks in the world. I mean, there can't be anything older than this. Right? Well, that's what I thought for a while too, but it turns out there might be an even older sock, and I guess only if you'd count grass insulation stuffed into a shoe as a sock. I know it might seem a bit tenuous, but come on, just because your sock might have a few holes in it and doesn't look exactly sock-shaped anymore doesn't mean it isn't a sock, right? Or maybe it's time for me to throw out some of mine, I don't know. Meet the Areni 1 shoe, which is both the oldest known leather shoe in the world and the oldest known closed toe shoe in the world, beating Otzi's when it was discovered back in 2008. It was discovered in a cave named Areni 1, which lies in southeastern Armenia, just across from the border with Iran. The shoe was found in a 45 centimeter deep yellow clay plastered pit, which had at its bottom a broken upturned bowl and a pair of goat horns and some fish vertebrae for whatever reason. After postgraduate student Diana Zardarian, pictured here, reached underneath the bowl in the dark, she pulled out this exceptionally well-preserved shoe, which even still has its laces. It's made of a single piece of leather and it's stuffed with, you guessed it, grass. The shoe probably once sat on the right foot of a woman, since it's 24.5 centimeters long and 10 centimeters wide meaning it's a modern U.S. woman size 7. But you gotta remember that every guy back then was a manlet, so who knows. At first, the excavators thought it might be from the late medieval period, but two samples of leather and one sample of the grass wound up being radiocarbon dated at facilities at Oxford and UC Irvine to between 5,337 and 5,627 years ago, making it another chalcolithic shoe, upwards of 300 years older than Otzi's. But I guess there is is technically a 28 year period when Otzi's could have been made first, so don't lose hope if you're a real Otzi stan. This one cave also claims to be the home of three other oldest things. The oldest preserved fragment of a human brain in the world, the oldest winery in the world, the oldest intentionally dried nuts in the world, and I guess 
the oldest socks in the world now, all from the Chalcolithic. The reason why these things are so well preserved is that Areni 1 has low humidity, a constant temperature, it's cool, it's dry, and on top of all that, the Chalcolithic floor of the cave ended up being covered in a thick layer of sheep dung, which sealed up all the objects underneath. There's still some uncertainty over whether the grass was meant to keep its owner's foot warm, meaning it was basically a sock, or that it was just meant to maintain the shoe's shape, meaning I guess it wouldn't be. Several sources still claim it acts as a sock, but according to a 2010 publication written by the excavators, it was more than likely used to maintain the shape of the shoe and or prepare it for storage because the grass was loose and unfastened without clear orientation and because of its archaeological context, suggesting it was meant to be stored. But I guess we'll never know if the grass was actively used as a sock or not, but I'm betting that since the grass in Otzi's shoe clearly was, these were too. As such, I deem these old bits of grass the oldest socks in the world. In case you want to visit it, it's now one of the star attractions in the History Museum of Armenia. Thank you so much for watching. This was unironically a wild ride, and I'm sure you and I both are glad to know what the oldest socks in the world are, even if having such esoteric knowledge is just completely useless no matter how you look at it. Alright, bye.